Thank you, thank you. Great to see you all here this morning. Uh, was that a great worship time? Let's thank the worship team for their work. I know having been up here for prayer, they haven't had a lot of time to practice yet, but uh, they did a great job. They made it look really easy, and I know leading worship is not easy. And uh, it's like a lot of things. If you've noticed, sometimes people can do things that they can make look really easy, but you know really are not easy uh, when they're doing it. I don't know if you know this guy, Messi. You heard of him? Uh, You watch him play soccer and he does things as he's cutting through a defense that looks so easy, but it's not easy to do that. And if you can remember, you probably don't, back in the day, Tiger Woods at the top of his game, he made hitting the ball 400 yards and sinking putts from 80 feet look easy, but it wasn't, it wasn't easy. And sometimes in music, it's the same way. Have you ever seen Dr. Rod play the guitar? Oh man, that guy can really play well and he makes it look so easy, but it's it's not easy. And I was thinking about this yesterday at church. We have a church where we use the organ for worship. Do you know what an organ is? Okay, come to First Pres sometime. We'll, We'll show you the organ in action. But I'm thinking this guy's up there, he's got both hands and both feet going and like 18 keyboards and pedals and it sounds so beautiful. And it looks easy, but I know it has taken years and years of practice to get to that point. And I think in our Christian lives sometimes there's something that looks easy but it's really hard when we actually get down to doing it. So turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 1 John chapter 4. You'll find 1 John toward the end of your New Testament after the books of 1 and 2 Peter, if that helps. Or just click on your phone at the appropriate place. John's an interesting uh, book in a lot of ways. Sometimes it's called an epistle or a letter, but it doesn't really seem to have the elements of an epistle when you look at it that you find in other New Testament letters. It doesn't state uh, who it was written for or who it was written by. It doesn't have the personal ending that you find in a lot of letters in the New Testament. Say hello to Joe and Jane and thank them for all their good work and I'll see you later. It just doesn't have that. Um, So it's not really a letter, but it does seem to have been written to a particular community or audience to solve certain problems that they were facing. It's generally believed that this book was written by John, the beloved disciple from the Gospels, author of the Gospel of John. It shares a lot of stylistic elements uh, and a lot of vocabulary with the Gospel of John. And the early church recognized John as the author of this letter or non-letter. And it seems like it was written sometime toward the end of the first century, probably around the year 90 AD. John's purpose in writing 1 John seems to have been to combat some ideas about Jesus that were circulating around and had sprung up and were infecting the church. We don't know the specific heresies that were present, but it seems likely that they were relating to a religious and philosophical movement known as Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a belief system that combined elements from a lot of different religions, Christianity, Judaism, Uh, other Eastern mystical religions, along with some philosophy, and uh, created a new system out of those things. Gnosticism wasn't really a systematic religion, didn't really have a systematic theology, but it did have some ideas that were pretty common in it. And a lot of those related to who Jesus is. 
Gnostics believe that the physical, material world is inherently evil. This material stuff, this physicality of ours is what leads us into problems. And so therefore, it must be evil. Well, if the physical world is evil, then the creator of the physical world must be evil. And that would mean to them that the God of the Old Testament was an evil God. Also, since the material world is evil in this system, Jesus could not have had a true physical existence that would have been evil. So this led to the belief that Jesus really only appeared to be human, but he wasn't really human, and therefore he never truly suffered. He never truly died. Gnosticism also usually included the concept that salvation was related to having some sort of uh, secret, special knowledge that was not available to normal people. Only select, super spiritual people had this special, mysterious knowledge that elevated them above others and gave them salvation. So you can see how that type of belief could lead to some negative dynamics in a community. You would have a division between the super spiritual and the normies, and that would create some dynamics in that community. So John's writing to present a correct understanding of who Jesus is and to promote fellowship in this community. If you ever really want to read some weird stuff, uh, go look up the Gnostic writings. That's Gnostic with a G, by the way. Uh, And you will find some really strange stuff, um, sort of science, sort of theological science fiction, uh, I might call it. Uh, And it gives you a sense of what the church was dealing with in the first couple hundred years as orthodoxy was being developed and as other things were were being uh, put down. So when we get to John chapter 4, John has covered some areas and he's now getting, turning his attention to God's love. So if you'll read with me 1 John 4 verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In these two simple verses, John makes the point that we should love each other because of our relationship to God. We love each other because of our knowledge of God. And we love each other because of the very nature of God himself. It seems so easy, and yet it can be very hard. So first, we love each other because of our relationship to God. Whoever loves has been born of God. If we're new believers... We are born of God, which makes us completely new people, and His Spirit lives in us. The old person is gone. The idea of being born again, of course, is found in John's Gospel. And it's one of the connections between 1 John and the Gospel of John. If you remember back in John 3, Jesus is talking to the Pharisee Nicodemus. Nicodemus said, seen Jesus. He wanted to find out more, so he goes to visit him at night, and Jesus says to him, unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus understood the radical nature of that statement, and initially he took it very literally. Imagine being the first one to hear the concept You must be born again. It goes against everything we know naturally to be the case. 
It is a radical idea. And let's not lose how radical that idea of being born again is simply because we hear that phrase a lot. Whatever we were like, whatever nature we had before becoming children of God is gone. It's over. And we're completely new. There's a spiritual DNA which we have now as God's children. If we're new, if we're God's children, if we're in a new relationship with Him, if we have that spiritual DNA, we have to love one another because love is from God. We love one another because of our relationship to God. We are spiritual siblings. Now, I hope you love your brothers and sisters, if you have any. Uh, I know sometimes that can be hard as well. And sometimes siblings fight more with each other than with anyone else. But when it comes down to it, we love our siblings because they're part of our family. And since we are in that relationship, we love each other. And it's the same for us as spiritual brothers and sisters. John's second point is that we love each other because of our knowledge of God. John says if we love each other, we know God. And if we do not love each other, it's evidence that we do not know God. Now, there are sort of two types of knowing. It's the difference between knowing about someone and knowing someone personally. You might know all about LeBron James. You might know all of his statistics. You might know the teams he's played on, the championships he's won or lost. But that's very different than actually knowing him, having his phone number in your phone and having that relationship with him. And I think both of these senses of knowing can make sense in this passage. If we know facts about God, and we truly understand who He is, we should understand that this means we should love each other. Also, if we truly know God in the sense that we have a relationship with Him, it follows that we love each other. Our relationship to Him has to have an effect on us, and it has to be mirrored in our relationships with others. Have you ever known someone who seems to know a lot about God, but whose life really does not demonstrate God's love for others? The conclusion is they don't really know God. Uh, in the field of biblical studies, of which I am a part, there's an annual meeting of the Society of Biblical Literature Thousands of people from around the country and the world get together. There are hundreds of seminars on biblical topics, but it's not remotely Christian. There's a lot of knowledge, but there's no relationship. It's just intellectual for a lot of those people. And this can be a danger at a place like CIU. We study the Bible a lot. You hear wonderful chapel messages a lot. You're really, I don't know, you are, but the, the chapel speakers, and I'm not talking about me, the chapel speakers we have are awesome. And you have the benefit of that. We have small groups. We have other times and other activities. And it's possible to think that all the learning we do about God is actually the same as knowing God. And it's not. Uh, in my doctoral work at Notre Dame, and we won this weekend, I just want that out there. I know it's been tough in South Carolina, but um, I got my Notre Dame tie on and everything. Um, but I studied, you know, doctoral seminars with really top-notch scholars and learned a lot. But a lot of those scholars were not only not Christian, they were atheists. 
So the, the, the knowledge was great, but the relationship was missing. So as you learn more and more about God, make sure that that relationship is actually growing and that you're maintaining your humility as you learn. John emphasizes this point by saying that lack of love for one another actually means someone does not know God at all. How can someone know God and yet not be showing love in their community of believers? It's impossible. So we love each other because we know God. The third reason John says we love each other is because of the nature of God himself. I'm sure even if you aren't a long time Christian, you've heard the phrase somewhere, God is love. But let's think about what that really means. Going back to our Indiana days, in Indiana, the um, best high school basketball player of the year is called Mr. Basketball. And the way they select Mr. Basketball is not that they go looking for the shortest, roundest, most orange basketball player in the state. I hear that snort. <laughs> Rather, they look for the player with the skills that, and actions that epitomize being the best basketball player in the state. And the same way when we say God is love, we're making a statement about God's actions in the world. Unfortunately, sometimes God is love is used by people to mean God would never judge my actions or beliefs. God is love. But this is a potentially fatal mistake because God absolutely will judge your actions and beliefs. His love does not negate his righteousness and his justice. So we know that God is love because of the actions God has taken. In verse 9 here in, in 1 John 4, says the greatest act of God's love is that he, the fact that he sent us his only begotten, totally righteous, perfect son to be an atoning sacrifice or propitiation for our sins. This is love. The whole scope of the Bible is about how God loves us so much that he's worked throughout history to bring people back to himself. And since he's acted toward us in love, we need to act toward each other in love. Our actions must reflect the, his character, character or its evidence that we are in fact separated from him. In fact, later in verse 20, John says, someone who, someone who says, I love God but hates his brothers and sisters is a liar. That's pretty strong language. Don't be a liar. So it's clear that we should love each other because of our relationship to God, our knowledge of God, God's nature. So why does it seem so hard sometimes? Why does it seem that something that should be so easy is hard for us to do? I have a few reasons. Number one, some of us are not so lovable. I know I'm not. I've been known to have an opinion. Right, James? <laughs> uh, I'm not the most cuddly person in the world. I grew up in New York, and I have some of that New York whatever it is. You know what I mean? I like to say two New Yorkers having a conversation looks like an argument about anybody else in the country. Uh, so I'm not the most lovable person in the world. Maybe you're not either. And that personality conflict can be a problem. One of the great miracles in the world is that I found a woman who loves me the way I am. And uh, pray for her, pray for her. Um, anyways, I hope you find that too. Another reason that it's hard to love each other sometimes is because our culture is not a culture in our society of love, is it? 
social media, once you get past the kittens and how everybody else's life is perfect, and you get to politics or whatever, it's angry. It's looking for the reasons to, to hate each other. And so we come into a community and, and our, our culture says, we're not looking for ways to love, we're looking for reasons to be upset with each other. I think another reason <clears throat> is that it, sometimes it's hardest to love our family members. I don't have to tell you, families can be complicated. Siblings tend to fight. Family dynamics can be very tough sometimes. So if a community has any similarity to a family, it can be tough to love each other sometimes. But if we are truly in relationship with God, if we truly know Him, if our God acts for us in love, we need to love one another. Now, I know this actually happens at CIU. Uh, last year at the um, Hall of Fame induction for the uh, CIU uh, Sports Hall of Fame, the inductee in his remarks told a story about uh, he had a fellow player on his team that he did not get along with, that he just did not like. And it got so bad he went to the coach and said to the coach, Coach, I do not get along with this player. I do not like him. What are we going to do? And the coach said, you have one job. Love that guy. Can you imagine a coach at any other university in the university, in the universe, giving that advice to a player? Love that guy. And I give great credit to this player. He took that to heart, and he did it. And out of that grew a tremendous, strong friendship with a guy that he did not get along with before. That's great. That happened at CIU. Uh, in meeting with uh, student leaders last uh, week, two weeks, three weeks ago now, uh, someone told a story of before they were even a student at CIU. Their family was here for various reasons. He was sitting down in the student center, and um, he saw a, a student clearly that was having some sort of distress, some sort of issue. And he saw another student come in and ask that student, what's going on? Clearly, they did not know each other. And said, I sat there and watched for a couple hours, I think, as these two guys talked, prayed, cried together. That's love. That happened at CIU. So I know it happens here, but I know we can do better. So here's my challenge to you. Are there a few of you in this chapel who through the Instagram you've been looking at all chapel or whatever, somehow <laughs> the message has penetrated somewhat that we need to love each other. Will you take that as a personal challenge? Are there a few individuals here who will do, I'm not gonna ask you to stand, I'm just saying, are there a few of you that would take this as a challenge? Is there a house or a hall on campus that would take as its project demonstrating love in our community? You might not win the shofar cup, but you might make a huge impact on CIU. Is there a hall or a floor that's willing to do that? Student leaders. Are you able and willing to lead your fellow students in what it means to love each other in our community? We need leaders. Can you be that leader this year? Now, I'm not asking you to love the people you already love. That is the easy part. I'm asking you to love the people you find it difficult to love. Maybe it is a teammate of yours that you don't get along with. Maybe it's a person on your hall who two weeks in you already know you are not going to get along with. Maybe it's just that in your reactions and your interactions, you need to have a more loving approach and attitude. But if there is someone that's really difficult to love that you want to 
show love to, here's what not to do. Okay, do not walk up to them and say, you know, uh, Joe, you're obnoxious. Uh, I don't like you, but I heard a great message in chapel. <laughs> and so out of my Christian duty, I am going to love even someone like you. Okay, don't do that. Well, what should you do? How about looking at 1 Corinthians 13? It's a good place to start. Maybe this semester in your personal Bible study, study love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not envious. Love does not brag. It is not puffed up. It is not rude. It is not self-serving. It is not easily angered or resentful. It is not glad about injustice, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. How does that sound? Wouldn't it be great if we were known because that's the way we treat each other at CIU? This means not looking for reasons to be offended. It means putting care for others above our own needs. It means treating others with respect and love. So what concrete step can you take in the next couple days to show love for someone else? Make it a personal goal in just the next couple days. I'm going to try to do that. Maybe that one day or two days will flow into a week. Maybe that week flows into a month. And pretty soon, that is the way that you live. It seems easy. It can be hard. That means we have to depend on God in order to do it. And on the Holy Spirit working in us to make it happen. And that's another whole message uh, in there alone. But I will just say the key to loving each other will be asking God to enable us to do it. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the love you have shown us. Dear God, help us to love each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Have a good day.